Next to capacity and defect of consent, the last reason for invalidating a treaty is that its very object is illegal because one of its obligations conflicts with a fundamental rule of international law. Under Article 53 of the Vienna Convention that I quote, a treaty is void if at the time of its conclusion it conflicts with a peremptory norm of general international law. For the purposes of the present convention, a peremptory norm of general international law is a norm accepted and recognized by the international community of states as a whole, as a norm from which no derogation is permitted and which can be modified only by a subsequent norm of general international law having the same character." End of quote. In the title of Article 53, peremptory norms of general international law are called in Latin jus cogens norms. Let us first try to understand the very notion of jus cogens before turning to its normative status, the ways it is formed and finally give some concrete examples of peremptory norms. As such, jus cogens is opposed to jus dispositivum. What does that mean? Well, simply that some norms can be derogated from by agreement between contracting parties, and those norms are called uh, jus dispositivum, they can be freely disposed of. While other norms cannot be set aside by mutual agreement, and those norms are peremptory, they are jus cogens. This dichotomy exists in every domestic legal system. Some legal provisions apply in the absence of any particular contract, while other legal provisions apply despite any contract. And contracts that do not conform with those peremptory provisions cannot be upheld in a court of law. They are invalid. Peremptory norms embody the notion of ordre public. And if the notion of jus cogens is not difficult to understand, it is nevertheless quite troubling in a legal order based on the sovereignty of states and resulting from their consent. And indeed, jus cogens means that despite their sovereignty, states are not entitled to validly consent and make treaties about whatever they wish. Juskogens is out of the reach of states. It is above them and they must always comply with it since they cannot escape it by concluding treaties which would pretend to dispose of it. Any such treaty would be null and void from the start or as stated under Article 64 of the Vienna Convention it would become void in case a new peremptory norm arises after the treaty has been concluded. The conceptual novelty introduced by Jus Cogens and the perceived limitation to state sovereignty it entails were not easily accepted. And for many years, the issue of Jus Cogens has been very divisive. However, international courts and tribunals, the European and the Inter-American Courts of Human Rights, the International, Criminal Court, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and finally the International Court of Justice. Those courts and tribunals have gradually referred to the concept of jus cogens, so that its very notion is undoubtedly part of today's international law. But what is the nature of jus cogens, and how do jus cogens norms come to existence? Well, there have been endless debates about the nature of jus cogens. Is jus cogens part of Kashmir international law or is it something completely different? Does it belong to the category of general principles or to another specific category of sources? In a case between Belgium and Senegal about the failure by Senegal to prosecute the former head of state of Chad accused of acts of torture, the International Court of Justice briefly said this, and I quote, In the court's opinion, the prohibition of torture is part of customary international law and it has become a peremptory norm, jus cogens, end of quote. The court went on to refer to practice and to opinio juris, 
So from the ICJ's point of view, it seems undisputable that Euskogen's norms are part of customary international law. They come to existence through the usual customary process. However, and because each and every rule of customary international law is not peremptory, Euskogen's norms are a special category of norms within customary international law. And this is because of the specific opinio juris that is required for their formation. Article 53 of the Vienna Convention makes this very clear by saying this, and I quote again, a peremptory norm of general international law is a norm accepted and recognized by the international community of states as a whole, as a norm from which no derogation is permitted and which can be modified only by a subsequent norm of general international law having the same character. End of quote. This is the specific opinion juris. This is all good and well, but which concrete norms can be set to appurtain to Euskogens? If one takes the threshold expressed by Article 53 seriously, not many rules of customary international law can be said to be peremptory. And it is, of course, very tempting to resort to the language of Euskogens in order to affirm that uh, a rule is very important. But this should not be done lightly. So for the time being, Euskogens is made of only a few norms and the collection of norms is not extensive. There is no official exhaustive list of them, but from the case law, the following Euskogens norms can be gathered. The prohibition of wars of aggression, the prohibition of genocide, of crimes against humanity and of war crimes, the prohibition of slavery, the prohibition of apartheid, and probably also of racial discrimination or ethnic cleansing. The prohibition of torture, as recalled above from the Belgian Senegal case. There may be other rules pertaining to Euskogens, and I do not pretend that this short list is exhaustive. But the prohibition I mentioned certainly belong to the felt necessities of contemporary international law. And it is good to take stock of the progress they represent in the common conscience of humanity. Let me make two final remarks about Euskogens. And the first remark is as follows. The concept of Euskogens was introduced in the Vienna Convention as a ground for contesting the validity of treaties. But so far, states have hopefully refrained from concluding treaties that would be contrary to peremptory norms. So invalidity of treaties for breach of Euskogens is rather hypothetical. However, this does not mean that Euskogens is not important as a legal concept. On the contrary, having peremptory norms within international law profoundly changes that legal order as it conveys the idea that certain core values are common to mankind and must be protected by norms that cannot be transgressed. Moreover, and as we shall see uh, later when discussing international responsibility, serious breaches of peremptory norms entail specific consequences. My second remark. Under the Vienna Convention, Euskogens is the only content-oriented ground for treaty invalidity. In other words, the fact that the treaty is substantially unequal, that one party takes all the benefit from the treaty while the other bears all the cost of it, this is not a ground for invalidating the treaty. And this may sound unfair, but the substantial inequality of the respective parties' obligation under the treaty is not a legal ground for considering that it is null and void. And this, of course, is without prejudice to a possible defect of consent as we have studied earlier.